I'm going to move straight on to uh, Patrick Valance, uh, President Pharmaceuticals R&D at GSK, to give us an industry perspective and any other perspective as a clinician scientist you wish to give, Patrick. Thanks, John. Do I just, uh, I have got a couple of slides I wanted to show you. Do I just, oh, there we are. Yeah. Okay, great. So first thing to say is that um, what's going on in our labs now are the medicines of 2025. So actually, things now are what's going to be there in the market in that sort of time frame. But I wanted to just spend a couple of minutes just reflecting on looking back and asking where are we. So this is what's happened in terms of number of new medicines per cost over the last 50 years or so, 60 years. And that is, so it's, it's the number of new medicines per billion dollars spent over time. And it's a pretty depressing curve. So this is inflation adjusted, showing that actually we've got the inverse of Moore's law. We've got decreasing productivity year on year per pound spent. That's the first point. It's actually changing, and it's changing quite rapidly. So this is not an inevitable law that drives down. In fact, it's got to change, and it is changing. Second thing is most of the R&D across the industry has been bankrolled by the USA and the US healthcare system, and that's changing. So almost all of the money comes from there into the industry. That is changing very rapidly. There are essentially four decisions that need to be made in <coughs> R&D in industry. The first is, where the hell am I going to start? Which target am I going to go after? The second is, which molecule or type of intervention am I going to try and tackle that target with? The third is, when I've got that, how do I do some form of experiment in humans to understand I'm on track to do something important? And the fourth is then, how do I exemplify that there is a benefit to this intervention in populations, in individuals, in a way that's suitable for them, doctors, healthcare systems to actually uh, go for. And those are the four decisions on which I just want to think a little bit about how things might look. The second thing to say is that if you look across where we are now, things are clearly not even. So now, across pipelines, about 40% of pipelines are full up with vaccines and biologics versus small <laughs> molecules. So there's been a big change in the type of thing that constitutes a medicine. Why have they increased? First of all, because there are opportunities in terms of making medicines there that didn't exist before that you can go after. But there's another fundamental reason, which is actually they're very difficult to genericize. So there is a, a reason, which is that actually you maintain the exclusivity on those for longer periods. And of course, the patent period is such that it starts ticking the moment you file it. The length of the R&D process is such that you end up with a rather truncated period by the time your medicine launches. And I think that's one of the drivers be behind the increase in other modalities, one of the drivers. In addition to this, if you look at what diseases are being targeted, 25%, I think it's higher than this now, 25% of pipelines are against cancer. One of the reasons they're against cancer is the targets are better exemplified. The basic biology allows you to understand where to go. The clinical readouts are somewhat more straightforward. And there is, there has been, I think it's changing, a receptive environment for those drugs to go into. So this isn't even. If you compare that with neuroscience, it's a very different picture. We don't know where to start. We don't have good models to test it in. And actually, it's difficult to get those things through. So this is not going to be even in terms of where the progression takes place. So what do I see as changes? Number one, it's very clear that the nature of diagnoses will change. We already see that very clearly in cancer, where I don't think anyone <coughs> now approaches uh, breast cancer and says, that is a disease I'm going after. They go for very clearly molecularly defined subsets. They go for groups of patients with very clear characteristics that allow you to segment the disease. That's happening increasingly in other areas. Is that a threat for industry? Absolutely not. I think it's actually part of what increases the probability of success of being able to make a medicine. It completely changes the model away from shooting for a, for a blockbuster. 
something that's going to be used in a broad population. So you can see a shift. It's going to be progressive. It's inevitable away from the blockbuster model towards segmented medicines for segmented populations as the diagnosis <coughs> change. The second change is the medicine itself. I've already said that we've moved away from small molecule white pill medicines towards many more other modalities, mainly biopharmaceutical antibody type medicines. There are waves of things coming beyond that. So antisense approaches are here and now, and there are an increasing number of antisense molecules coming through. There is also now, I think, a very, very real possibility of gene therapies in a number of areas. And we've certainly got a phase three program in gene therapy, we've got more than one, others have got it as well. And you can see gene manipulation approaches, ex vivo gene manipulation and cells going back to treat cancer. Those are very dramatically different ways of thinking about treatments that will have a profound impact on how we deliver healthcare and actually how one thinks about the distribution of medicines, because you are now not distributing necessarily a product, you're distributing something which when combined with a cell becomes the product that has very big implications for how systems are organized. So the nature of the medicine changes, add on top of that, the growing area of interest in things like electronic interventions to try to alter health those, again, will have a different model which will have an implication for how we think about delivering inter uh, treatments. The third area is monitoring. And uh, whilst there's an awful lot of uh, hype in this area, and I don't know how many people in this room, but wherever I seem to go, everyone's wearing a band now which is monitoring their activity. And uh, you know, some of that is pretty good and effective. What I did learn when I visited a West Coast company not long ago is if you go like that for 20 minutes, it looks as though you've run a marathon. So, uh, you know, don't be fooled when somebody tells you they're very active. Also, watch out if your teenage son looks as though he's running a marathon every night. He may not be, OK? Um, <coughs> so monitoring, though, is definitely a big uh, area that's changing. We and others in clinical trials are increasingly using multi-modality sensors. It will be real time. It will impact in terms of how people think about monitoring in the clinic after drugs come through it will lead to a very different type of clinical trial. It will also lead, I think, to a very different interaction with patients in clinical trials, something I'll come back to. So monitoring, real-time monitoring, wearable devices, and I think the mantra in this field is the wearable device needs to become invisible. And I think that's where things are going, invisible wearable devices with real-time data collection. The fourth change is access, and I, I, I really don't know which way this is going to go, particularly in the UK, but the first type of access, I mean, is how do you get your medicine or your intervention into a healthcare system? It can either become more and more rigorous in terms of the totality of evidence you need to gain access, or it can move to earlier and earlier access with the need to collect data, possibly from monitors and so on, real-time sensors. I don't know which way that's going to go. I think it's quite a profound question for the UK because as if we move in the direction of later and later access, you end up with a very different innovation culture in the healthcare system as opposed to moving earlier. If you move earlier, you clearly carry risk in terms of the types of things that become available before you've got the full data set. My view is that when a medicine's launched, you know about 50% of what you need to know that other 50% comes from somewhere after you've launched the medicine. So access in that sense is going to be important. But the second thing is it's going to be increasingly impossible, I believe, for companies to make medicines which are not available across the globe. And so there's a question about access and pricing across the globe. That has implications for Africa and elsewhere. It absolutely has implications for how you make your medicines. So I think we'll find very, very different looking factories in the future, very different production facilities, very different mobile units that allow you to manufacture in different places in low cost environments. And finally, the patient's clearly going to change. Um, you can already see it in lots of places. I think with sensing, with remote data capture, with direct feedback on things, that there's going to be a very different relationship between the patient, the doctor, and also, of course, in things like clinical trials. I think it's going to be dramatically different. It already is in some places. And the patient influence is going to become much, much more evident. 
So what does that mean for R&D? First, we've already heard about open innovation. I think one of the curses in the industry has been people have protected too much and tried to invent, which is what we do, invent the medicine on the basis of knowledge which they want to keep secret. The invention itself, of course, needs to be protected. The knowledge base for making the medicine needs to be much more open, in my opinion. We've got one extreme model, which we operate in our Disease of the Developing World unit, where actually everything we do is totally open. Why? Because I don't know how to make a medicine for malaria without lots of people being involved. We put all of the structures, everything in the public domain. There's a very fluid interaction between academia and industry in that model. If that works, and it's a big if, if that works as a way of getting a medicine faster, the question I think society will throw back is, well, if you can do it for malaria, why can't you do something like that for diabetes? So that's the extreme end of open innovation. I think outside that, there are lots of other areas. I mean, we announced today a relationship with the European Bioinformatics Institute and the Sanger about getting information out into the public domain on what constitutes targets. I think that's just a knowledge base for the entirety of the industry. It's not just for us. It's not something we can keep secret. And I think clinical trial data and other data relevant to prescription will be all available in the public domain. Second thing is this is global. I think the industry as a whole has been very, very dominant in parts of Europe and the US. It's clearly going to be global. You can see China developing its own pharmaceutical industry. You can see other areas doing it. It's going to change the landscape. There will, however, and this I think comes back to the point Nancy was making, I believe, be major hubs, by which I mean some places where you really have the totality of outstandingly well-trained individuals, outstanding universities, a biotech sector which is vibrant, and then the only people who can really pull this together to make medicines, which is big pharma in one place. The UK is lucky to have two such companies I think it's going to be difficult if we lose those and we end up with none. You can't rebuild that, and I think this is a very competitive area. So I think this maintenance of the entirety of the ecosystem is incredibly important because there will be a few major hubs in the world where this can happen. Real-time iteration, I've talked about. There will be instant feedbacks in clinical trials, which will mean clinical trials will look dramatically different. You'll get responses instantly that allow you to change direction during the course of a study. I think you'll also get instant feedback in terms of surveillance of medicines post-launch with various sensing devices, <coughs> monitors, and listening to patients in real time much more than we're able to do at the moment. And then my final point, which may seem totally bizarre and counterintuitive, is I've argued there'll be less uncertainty. What do I mean by that? The curve at the beginning, the relentless decrease in productivity against price, tells you that this is a, an industry where the margins are decreasing. It has to become more certain in its ability to make a medicine. That, I think, will be driven by the increase in knowledge of human biology, which is real, the ability to segment patient populations so you can start in a more secure place, test in a more secure place. I think there'll be more medicines for smaller indications with a higher degree of probability of success of getting there. That's a pretty dramatically different model from the one that's been played out over the last 50 years, which is low probability of success, massively high returns if you hit the jackpot on it and has driven a certain type of behavior. I think that's changing, and we'll see a very different model, which fundamentally is built on slightly reduced uncertainty, and therefore a difference in terms of the expected margins that will be available in the business. Thank you.